the Pulitzer Prize-winning uh, dynamic writing duo, uh, who are writing re most recently for Vanity Fair, their latest book, Out Tomorrow, The Betrayal of the American Dream. Uh, the former CEO of the banking giant Citigroup is drawing headlines for publicly calling for the breaking up of the nation's largest banks and for restoring the separation of commercial investment banking. Sandy Weil made the comments last week in an interview on CNBC. What we should probably do is go and split up investment banking from banking, have banks be deposit takers, have banks make commercial loans and, and uh, real estate loans, have banks do uh, something that's not going to risk the taxpayer dollars, that's not going to be too big to fail. That's a pretty radical idea, though, the idea of breaking up the investment banks and the banks. Are you suggesting going back and, and, and really breaking these companies up? Uh, that's exactly what I'm suggesting. <laughs> so I, I want to see the United States be the leader. I mean, I, I, re I really believe in our country. And we're not going to be a leader if we keep on trashing our institutions. A former head of city group, um, Sandy Weil, very significant. He was the major <laughs> lobbying force right. uh, to end Glass-Steagall. Right. Uh, of course, President Clinton signed off on it. And now this is what he's saying. Um, Don Bartlett, Jim Steele. We'll, we'll both <laughs> take a shot at this. But there was a reason that this law went in Glass-Steagall went into place after the Great Depression. There was no reason whatsoever to change it, and everybody who recommended that was flat wrong. Now, I don't know where Wiles coming from now. He's he, some terminal disease, and he wants to clear his conscience or what. It never should have been repealed. That served to benefit only one tiny slice of the population, the people at the top, and it did enormous harm to broad middle-class America. It's one reason, in part, why uh, people lost their homes. I mean, one of the things that happened uh, after the, the removal of that firewall is it then became the whole mortgage the industry. Commercial banks and Commercial banks and investment banks. Uh, the whole mortgage industry was transformed by this. If you go back a few years and you were buying a house or a co-op or a condo or whatever it was, you almost had to mortgage your firstborn child in order to get a mortgage. I mean, you had to go through a very dramatic process. But because selling the mortgages the fees and so forth was more important than whether the person's ability to pay and so forth led to all kinds of abuses. It wasn't just they put people in houses who shouldn't have been there. They actually tricked an awful lot of people who had been in their house and, but who had been misled about the provisions of those instruments because the fees up front were so important and so significant. So if he's now, if, if Weil is now finally getting religion, um, that's wonderful. It's hard to imagine what has provoked this, but the fact is he's absolutely right, and it never should have happened. The fact that uh, I think Clinton signed it because it was part of the whole deregulatory mindset that has gripped this country for really the last two or three decades. Before that, it was true in airlines, it was true in the trucking industry. Uh, in two industries where the wages have been driven down, the earnings driven down tremendously for the people who are in those fields, and the profits of many of the companies in those fields have not, not been borne out. Both those industries have just been in total chaos for 20 to 30 years, and they extended that even with that record in 1999. They further repealed Glass-Steagall, which then further added to that chaos in financial services. I the other thing that, 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 that uh, runs along with this is that uh, the jobs, everybody talks about creating jobs. Nobody looks at the kind of jobs that are being created. They are at the bottom end of the wage scale, which also you know, fuels this ripple effect, really, um, on, on, um, on tax revenue and Social Security revenue, because under the old system in which people had jobs that paid solid middle class wages, now you've got jobs in which people pay little or no taxes because they don't make enough money to pay the taxes. And that in turn impacts the deficit. And so people are talking about, well, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna fix this deficit overnight, are just uh, people who want to take care of that tiny 1% at the top. There is no other reason to do that. You write deregulation is one of the greatest triumphs of America's ruling class, but the middle class workers and their families, the fallout has been devastating. What about retirement and pensions? One of the most uh, 
astonishing statistics that we think we have in the book, because we were not aware of this statistic. Since 1985, almost 85,000 pension plants have been killed. In the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, even into the early 80s, more and more people were um, eligible for pensions, defined benefit plans where you got a specific benefit when you did retire. But since the mid-80s, corporations with the great assistance of Congress have been shifting people out of pensions and into 401 k plans. Now, there's nothing wrong with 401 k plans, but originally they were viewed just as a supplement to a pension. They were not viewed as a pension. The corporation saw this would be a lot cheaper for them. It would shift the responsibility totally to the employees and the workers, but it would also not contribute enough to really take care of their retirement needs. So what's happening with this? This is one of the greatest tidal shifts in the country because we were going in a certain direction for decades. Middle class people, I mean, not everybody had a pension. We know that. But more and more did over time. But since the 80s, this has now been totally reversed. And it raises all kinds of questions about what retirement is going to be like for people. The main question is, people are going to have to work forever. And yet, what are those jobs going to be? What are they going to pay? And it also puts pressure then on people coming into the workforce. How are they going to get a job if people are having to work between 65 and 75 years old? That's going to put even more pressure on the, on the, the jobs that are left. And the other irony of this is, this is almost another Sandy Weil incident. Uh, you have uh, the current head of AIG, who was not there during the collapse. He had nothing to do with it. He worked for another global insurance company. He was brought in after AIG collapsed, and the taxpayers bailed them out, and they still haven't paid everything back yet. Um, <clears throat> He was quoted as saying earlier this year that people are just going to have to get used to the idea of working until, there are, until they are 70 or 80. Now, uh, he made that pronouncement from his villa on, uh, in, Dubro in Dubrovnik in, in Croatia. Uh, you going to work till you're 80? Uh, we have a friend down who, who uh, is, a, you know, is a job recruiter, basically, and she said, Look, she said, if you're over 50 now, you're going to have trouble getting a job. She said, I hate to say it, but I, I tell people you can't look your age anymore. You really can't. And she was talking about somebody in their 50s and maybe 60, 80. You got to be kidding me. I mean, we have the uh, uh, Betty. Yeah, the woman in the woman book in the who was solely dependent on Social Security, as, as millions of Americans are, who had to continue to work well beyond 65. She actually, for a long time, delivered meals, meals on wheels, to people in some cases younger than herself. She worked for a tax preparation company for another 20 years until she was laid off in her late 80s, um, still looking for work at this point. That's very true of many people. So even if you get a job, though, you're going to be putting pressure on the other end of the workforce. And, very quick. And, and the, the one job I was counting on was being a, a greeter at Walmart. And now Walmart's killed their greeter program. I mean, <laughs> so what are you going to do? Veterans, what they used to yeah. face, what they face today. This, w w one of the places we visited was a veteran center outside of Fort Myers, Florida. And this is what brought the mortgage crisis home to really us. It isn't the story of people who just um, are buying a house who maybe should not own a house. Many of the veterans in that center had owned houses for many years, but some of them had been tricked by the, the circumstances of their mortgage. Some had lost their home. Some were on the verge of losing their home. These are after people, some of these people, their service went back, a couple of them to World War II, many the Korean War, Vietnam, and so forth. Beyond that, the young veterans coming into this center, some of whom had done all the right things. They'd served multiple tours of duty. One in particular had gone back to college, gotten his degree, but then began to look at what was available out there and was thinking about re-enlisting then in his mid-30s because he saw no real job opportunities. This is one of the, the, the underlying things of the book. We make the point, yeah, manufacturing got hammered and continues to get hammered over time. But our jobs are supposed to be these knowledge-based jobs, the smart jobs, the service jobs. These are not the whole process that began eliminating the blue-collar jobs has now moved into the white-collar field with a real vengeance. Even the, even the Labor Department is, is finally sensing this. And they had a study a couple of years ago. It said 160 service occupations, 25 percent of the entire service workforce 
is susceptible to offshoring. We only have a few minutes. You have a whole chapter, the last chapter, Restoring the American <laughs> Dream, which is devoted to solutions. Lay them out. Well, one of what, the most obvious thing to us, and the thing we put first, is the tax code. The tax code needs to be amended. The folks that can afford to pay more should. Almost every poll out there shows widespread American support for this. I mean, this is what's so bizarre about Boehner's comment about uh, raising taxes on people who make money. It's just totally ridiculous. People can afford it. Many rich people say that and have come forth to say that. So, and putting in multiple brackets. And brackets mean the more you pay, the more you earn, the more you pay. That's the way things used to be. And the country thrived under that system. And it didn't penalize anybody and it didn't create class warfare. It actually created a very broad based society. Trade policy is another that needs to be amended. Don't just have our door open, let everybody send their stuff in, unless they're going to do the same with us, which has never happened. We've never had the guts to enforce the proper trade policy. A significant thing we also talk about is we really need to invest in the country, because corporations aren't. So many of them are going abroad. A true broad-based investment infrastructure and many other things. The largest peacetime uh, infrastructure investment program in this country was under Dwight Eisenhower in the 50s, the Interstate Highway Program. And that was with broad bipartisan support. I mean, that's what we need to get back to in this country. Obama's rather anemic uh, stimulus program was roundly condemned uh, by conservatives when, in fact, it's things like that that are part of the solution to the problem. We're going to end the conversation here. We're going to continue it offline. Post it at democracynow.org. Don Bartlett, James Steele, the Pulitzer Prize-winning dynamic reporting duo. Their latest book is called The Betrayal of the American Dream. Uh, they are the authors 20 years ago of the number one bestseller, America, What Went Wrong? That does it for the show. If you'd like to get a copy, you can go to our website at democracynow.org.